I remember a time when my neighborhood was my entire world. From Mr. Wiggins' house to Wee Jesse's yard to buying penny candies at the Keyhole Castle Corner store, that's all there was. I saw a Sesame Street reflection of neighbors, families, and schoolyards. In these self-reliant communities, Dad would help build fences with neighbors. Mrs. Wiggins would sweep the sidewalk from one block sign to the other. Spare lots were transformed into BMX tracks in the summer and ice rinks in the winter. And everybody kept up with community news at the local store. The store was run by A.J. Swinghammer from 1906 to 1934. His son, A.J. Swinghammer, ran it from 1934 to 1968. Myself and my wife ran it from 1968 to 2003. We've run the store now for 35 years. The store years ago sold everything from men's suits, work clothes, shoes, everything in ladies' wear, sewing supplies, yarn, towels, you name it, we sold it. Customers were given chips and the next time they came in, it was exchanged for groceries. It's a barter chip, I guess. Chip. This, they started from a, a five cent chip to a dollar chip. Swing hammer. Swing hammer, that's the original. Lots of unique things about the store. It still had the old wooden oil floors. We had virtually no coolers, very little freezer equipment. And we still had the old string tied uh, lights. You just went down every morning and just pulled each light down and eventually the place was lit up. One of the things is uh, our unique embossed metal ceilings and walls. They've been in the store for 95 years. Peter and Mary Jean Nicholson owned and operated a local grocery for 13 years and felt as though they were an important social fixture in their community. Mary Jean's a good gossip. So as a result, uh, if something was happening in town, people say, what's happening? And this is the first place that they'd come usually. It was a message board for sure. The store, I think, it paid a major part. And uh, not only just for the gossip and stuff, but, but it, was, it was sort of a central gathering place, especially when we got the post office. You almost have to be from the community in order to succeed, or at least, at the very least, community-minded. So there's all kinds of things from the school to the, the recreation board that uh, if they're treated right, if they're given good deals, and it soon gets around the community that you're supporting the community in that way, and then they come back and support you. So. You're involved in everything when you're in a small community because there are so many people, and if people won't work together, nothing gets done. Like, you know, uh, we belong to the church, we uh, help the bazaars, we help this and that. It's, you know, it's a just vicious circle. Everybody helps each other and makes the community alive, you know. Everything that goes on there, Slapping on the walls and slapping on the on the pillars and posts and uh, yeah, I mean yeah, it does. It ends up being a bulletin board for everyone, uh, you know, which is a good thing. We don't mind. It's uh, part of the community, part of being a community, I guess. Lulu's hair design has been serving the Queen Alexandra community for over 14 years, from the corner of 72nd and 107th Street. I live it upstairs. I'm I'm 24 hours in here. <laughs> Wake up five minutes before work. And yeah, that's go. right. That's right. Yeah. And th this location is just in the center. Very good. Very good. Yeah. 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 Neighborhood. The people very nice. Yeah. I lot. I had a lot of people. You know, came from this area. Come for haircut. Oh yeah. I had the uh, Dorothy store. She lived close by, and she come every week. And I do have Alfie, and she come every, every week as well for her head. And I do have Margaret, and have Pat, like Mrs. Coder, you know, she come quite often. And uh, Julia is called from here, Art, is her, her husband. Uh, Levoy, he's a lawyer, he lives close by here. Let me think, <laughs> so many. <laughs> oh, hello, hello. You need a haircut today, or just? Shampoo and blue dry. Nope, or cut. 
Not too much. Just a little bit. Have you been to the fringe yet? Yeah, two times. Oh, fun for you. Oh, yeah. Today. Oh, today? Oh. You didn't have fun for a long time, eh? Since yeah, when summer? No. no, last summer? Oh, no. Christmas. No, March. It's a March? Here you are. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, bye bye. We'll see you in yep. one month later, eh? Yep. Thank you. Bye bye. Delton Grocery understands the value of helping out in their community. Welcome to the Delton Grocery. <laughs> This store is the convenience for the pupils. This this lot is a, is the commercial lot. Already when when they you know make this neighborhood, they make also convenience help for the pupils who are living here. Very hard to run away. Sometimes they don't have a car, you know, so they can walk and they can buy. Children and the old people and the young people, everybody is coming here for, for buying every stuff here. So suppose sometimes they have short money, they don't have money. We are, we have to help them. Sometimes they can get a credit from here. After that, when they have money, you uh, salary, you know, they, they can, they are paying their credit you know sometimes they short money we have to help to the pupils and they are helping to us here you know yeah i don't know how many owners was before but uh, one chinese guy was a uh, work here in this store about 10 years after that he sold to the one one Lebanani guy mr ahmed he was keep on only about nine months and after that uh, his wife was sick so he sold to us this store will be continues for the help of the pupils. Even the owner can be changed, but the store, I think so, will be maintained as same condition. We like Canadian, that's good. Other local merchants who have customers from outside their communities still find a way to contribute in their neighborhoods. Yes, I'm addicted to poppy seed anything, and Hilton and Michelle have some great poppy seed treats. My name is Michelle Dinner and I'm one of the owners of the Bonton Bakery. Uh, we have a youth emergency shelter as our pet charity. So we do have boxes at the tills. We collect uh, for them all year round. And we've designated February as Youth Emergency Shelter Month. And whatever money we collect in the month of February, we match that dollar for dollar so we can give them a, a larger amount. and. Um, they don't have any funding, they rely totally on fundraising, so that's become our pet charity. Um, we donate bread to Inner City High, to the Hope Mission that runs a uh, food program downtown. There's a single parent group at the Misericordia Hospital that gets bread from us once a week. We're often approached by local community leagues and schools to donate to if they're having fundraisers and things like that, and we're always very happy to do that, and we feel in that way we can contribute to the community around us. Welcome to the OGMND! For some local merchants, treating their community like family comes natural. It's a family-run operation, my wife and my daughter and uh, even got a couple of grandkids that help out once in a while. Deborah, she uh, will crack the eggs for us and uh, she's usually here standing on the chair when she's by herself. People can walk to my store here. I'm right across from the school. We service the school with uh, uh, kids come over for lunches, um, the meat pot pies, this kind of thing. Something quickly they can stick into the microwave. Uh, my name is Jennifer and my parents own this store, it's from the Earth. We decided to open it 
decided we were going to have a community wall and it got too big. It starts off over there actually. And so we donate to uh, North Edmonton students, uh, also a program called ABC Head Start down in Beverly. Uh, churches, we do the MS walk, we donate uh, watermelon, uh, Meals on Wheels. We also donate to Food Not Bombs every Saturday. We have East Glen's food program comes in sometimes to do tours, scavenger hunts, see what prices are. They get my dad gives them little information sessions about how things are grown and stuff like that. So, well, we do that. We do a lot of uh, charity work, uh, donations. Uh, like Ben Capro School has a summer program. We donate produce for their kids there. Um, wherever it helps the the needy or for children especially, we do a lot for that. Despite the obvious appeal of these friendly, convenient neighborhood stores, a more popular alternative looms miles from home. Transport and consumption rates have risen considerably, causing the local merchant to lose his customers. Our radius of daily travel has expanded beyond our neighborhood streets and into the shopping complexes at the edge of town. Where at one time grocery shopping brought the community together in one location, we now leave our community far behind to make the weekly trek to the shopping mile. Warehouses, bulk wholesalers, and superstores fill a mile-wide patch of asphalt. We buy obscene quantities of cereal, soup, and canned goods in order to save 10 cents at a time. These centers are designed to get you in, served, and purged as quickly as possible. Ironically, these centers often have so much product and so much traffic that you spend the majority of your time standing silently in line, reading tabloid headlines, instead of discussing community news and events with friends and neighbors. Bulk buying has become a way of life. People like to see a lot of variety. Uh, in, uh, you know, this store was, uh, had great variety, uh, you know, 50 years ago. But it's like anything, uh, you know, trying to keep up to the big box stores and community, and it's virtually impossible. I mean, a lot of these stores, their cookie department is as big as our store. Uh, you know, their produce department is humongous and, uh, you know, they get fresh daily product and, and uh, you know, we sell a lot of our small coolers and pressers and we just don't have the volumes and, and at some cases uh, probably don't have the buying power because of circumstances and bigger stores and people are more, more mobile. Uh, it isn't quite the meeting place it used to be. They're making it difficult in, in communities that aren't community minded. If, if they're extremely like the, if, if this store was to sell and uh, somebody local would, I think the people would rally around and, and uh, they don't want the store to go. So I think they'd support it. But we're so mobile now that it's difficult to keep people here. It's like things have changed so much in in the shopping industry, at one time, stores were only allowed to be open 40 hours a week. Uh, there was no Sunday shopping. Uh, so, you know, we chose to uh, be open six days a week, uh, 10 hour days, uh, which is still 60 hours for shopping. But, uh, you know, it's appeal pretty appealing to go to the big stores. Uh, you know, it just is. So you do it yourself. Yeah. And we'd start at seven o'clock in the morning and still be here at eight o'clock at night. And it was pretty well seven days a week, even though the store was closed on Sundays. So it got to the point where we just couldn't handle the, the physical work anymore. And we were tired, tired of working those, those kind of shifts, you know, that kind of long hours. Our kids started to mean more, they needed more time. All the business I have, it takes a long time. 
about 14 hours in the new generation they don't want to long hour duty they want eight hours and nine hours like that you know it was a great business it kept all our family occupied busy we had four children and they all had the opportunity to work here excellent training uh, learn, learn the value of money learn the value of work things have changed like anywhere and some of it's good, some of it's bad, but it does hurt small communities and small business people. As a local merchant, you basically have two options for survival. Either you work the exhausting hours and sell yourself purely out of convenience, or you take yourself out of competition with the big box stores altogether and find a less saturated market to serve. I like little shops. I'm used to little shops. I don't like big things. So I like to buy things in the small shops. I like white half to go to the different little stores there. Much better than to go to West Edmonton Mall, which I've been only once, which I didn't like, unfortunately. So I'm more of a small shop type of shopper. So I like places like that. I hope, I wish there would be more in Edmonton. It affects our business in that I think there are certain people who like to pay a small amount of money on, on their purchases and groceries. And if that is a big factor um, for some people, it would affect our business. But uh, since we've taken over the business and we've put a lot of effort into being known and telling people what we do, our business has grown. So uh, there will always be the big box supermarket, but there's still a place for us. We believe that it, uh, well, the quality of the product as well as the specialty items is what brings people in. Yeah. You know, I don't like the bread that they sell at IGA or Safeway. I think it's, you know, it's, it's not bread. This is, so I think it's nice to have little shops like this where you can go and pick up fresh stuff, fresh things. You know, like you know, you feel it's been done. You know, like this morning and you know, it tastes good. Our customer base is the neighborhood as well as a large part of Edmonton. We draw in people from the south side, from the northeast end. Anybody who really is interested in good quality bread and pastries made from scratch. So you guys get a lot of people commuting from the other side of town there? We do, yeah. We're on a very busy road, so we do get people coming from other areas. We don't see other people in the bakery industry as competition. We just like to do what we do really well and we're happy that other people do well and if we don't make a certain product and somebody else does, we're always happy to refer people to somebody else who makes something different to us and hopefully just as good because I think that you sort of uh, work off each other and that good quality product is what counts. Yeah. So we don't like to think about the other bakeries as competition. We fit a niche market. Uh, as a green grocer, uh, you don't see a lot of these in, in, uh, on the prairies. Uh, they're more, uh, you see them in Vancouver, you see them in Toronto, LA, things like that. Um, that was just uh, something that I think that's, would have come to its own time, you know, eventually, and that's why we tried it. A lot of customers do come from the neighborhood, but we do pull in people from Sherwood Park, St. Albert, from the West End. Well, I think they come here because we're, we're very budget conscious. We provide them with, I, I feel, good quality product uh, at, a, at, a, at a, I think, a far better price than they can get at a conventional supermarket. Uh, we can also bring in the unique things, like right now we're bringing in a lot of product from the Okanagan with the different type of melons and peppers that they have that you don't see in a chain or a supermarket. You walk into a chain store, they don't talk to you. They don't. They don't. Uh, you know, they might say good morning to you, but you know, I can sit down. I can talk to people about where products are coming or when it's going to be here. Or you know, it's more personalized. Is what I think. So.
You know, I I really don't believe with the quality of sausage that we provide, we don't have any competition. I really believe that. It's the different type of consumer that will go to that um, mass-produced type products. Go ahead. And some of it tastes okay. Yeah. <laughs> As a small business person, we just can't be afraid of that because there is a market for what we do too. The sausage maker who taught me how to make sausage, he says, this is what you have to start off with. This is what I started off with. And it's hard to operate. It's all done by hand and it's heavy and cumbersome. But it got me started in the business. Did it teach you anything? Yeah, not to buy another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> when he opened up the business, he made what? How many kinds of sausage did you make when you started? Four. Four. Yeah, we're going to open a business with four sausages, you know? And, if, well, now. 22. 22. Like, because people have asked for different things. I mean, we didn't need haggis. It wasn't a family tradition in our house to have haggis or black pudding or white pudding. It's just stuff that the customers have asked for. Guy walked in from the neighborhood, said, Could you make Lunenburg sausage? And I had never heard of Lunenburg sausage. So I said, you give me a recipe, he says, and I'll make it for you. Well, he didn't have one, but he knew a, a gentleman in Lunenburg who had the recipe. And so he gave it to me on the condition that I used to save it from other store shops. It's a real good sausage. My grandkids have always been fussy about um, the type of product that they put in their mouth and um, First I had to sell them, and then I could sell to the public. I'm not sure when it was that we lost our corner store communities. I don't know when it was that I stopped talking to neighbors on my block. And I don't remember the last time I shopped at a corner store. But I do remember a time when my neighborhood was my entire world. From Mr. Wiggins' house to Wee Jesse's yard to buying penny candies at the Keyhole Castle corner store. That's all there was. <laughs>